Hello, thank you for joining me on the Channels Book Club. I am Olakunle Kasumo. Did you ever try to win a girl's love with a love letter? Or as a girl, did you ever receive one? I'm not talking about the type of modern day love letters sent by emails and Facebook messengers. I mean the back in the good old days, five pages of love letters that ended with words like doxology, which are best left in Latin hymn books. Well, if you did, or you want to know what those funny love letters sounded like, you should read Victor Ehikamenor's book titled, Excuse Me. A few episodes ago, we showed you clips of Victor reading one of those sample love letters from his book at an event hosted by Relay Gallery. His reading brought back fond memories for many viewers. We'll show you that book reading session again, but first, let's get started with the chat I had with the author, who is a highly regarded writer, painter, visual artist, and creative director. He shared with me his personal writing experiences, his thoughts on Nigerian books and writers, and his book titled, Excuse Me. Okay, let's talk about your book now, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. Um, now, now, this is creative nonfiction. Yeah. Is that what you write all the time? Um, not really. I started with poetry, actually, which uh, I have a poetry collection, which was published in 2003. And um, I wrote mostly um, fiction. But I was also writing creative nonfiction. But it was when I relocated to Nigeria that I really started writing creative uh, nonfiction because I had a column uh, in the now defunct Next newspaper uh, every Friday. And because I was a creative director I, and um, as a writer, I needed more cerebral space to be able to write fiction. But the, the, load, uh, the workload of, being, of designing newspaper every day and all that didn't really give me the space to write that fiction just settled and so. But I, I was observing my country, reminiscing on where I'm coming from and all that, you know, so, and the quickest way to push them out and use it to look at the society that I was now living in was to adopt the creative nonfiction, which has been there forever. I think it's an essay, but I would say essay written from a perspective that you almost think is fiction, you almost think it's not real. It's not reportoria per se, it's, it's analytical, it's, um, I would say like um, writing a story pretty much, but from a flair, it's true, it's true story, it's facts. That's what they call it, creative nonfiction, yeah. yeah so. Okay, um, I've been curious about your dedication. Mm. You wrote here, for my father, a philosopher who laughed in words, yeah. and my mother, a soldier who fought with words. Yeah. What did you have in mind? Uh, they are, both of their characters, I was looking for a way to encapsulate them, those characters, um, their major character traits. My father was more like a philosopher, but he was very jovial. My father was hilarious. Even if he's telling you something very serious, he won't be so angry in delivering it. You just put it in nice words, in jo you know, in a, in a humorous way. So he was a satirist, uh, an oral satirist, because he didn't write. And um, I borrowed that from him. And um, he also used parables a lot, you know. So, and he would bust out laughing in, during conversations and everything. Um, and my mom, um, sorry to be using past tense, he passed, uh, he passed, he just passed recently. So, um, is um, she was she was more the militant type. She was the one that made sure that if you don't go to school, <laughs> she will have some very serious words to tell you that will explode right in your face. You know, so she was quite militant in raising me. I would say, you know, so uh, that's why I use those things. She used words mostly, like she would tell you something. You know, like a woman would say one word to you and you go to bed having sleepless <laughs> nights because of the way. Um, she has put it. So that was why I put both of them. That's why you described her as soldier who fought with, with words. words. Yes. Very crazy. Thank you. Now, a lot of people don't know that you design book covers and you are the 
designer behind a lot of book covers, yeah. top Nigerian books. T tell me a bit about that. Um, well, it's part of, it comes with it. <laughs> it kind of comes with the territory from people starting to want to use my art to, for their covers because as a writer, I also have a lot of friends in the writing community. Almost all Nigerian writers, we have encountered each other one way or the other, or we are friends, or we belong to one you know, group, you know, maybe online group or the other. So from starting, them requesting for me to give them permission to use my artwork, which because they are familiar with the works, they are writing and I'm writing both words by being a writer at the same time, being an artist. So it was convenient for them to say, ah, please, oh boy, let me use your art to uh, illustrate my book. I just wrote a book and they need a cover for it. Can you send something, you know? So. Um, starting with uh, Chikao Nigwe, who wanted a cover, to Unoma Azua, to uh, Chimamada Adichie's first book, which uh, they commissioned me to photograph something for the cover, Popo Hibiscus. I was still living in the U.S. then. So after that, it was just like a floodgate of uh, opening, you know, doing up to, I'll say, more than 100 book covers, wow. both um, locally and internationally for, for journals for magazines, um, you know, not counting, of course, uh, some of the covers that I designed for Next newspaper. Mm. Yeah. So, so you did um, Chika Nugwe's, uh, which of her books? Did well, two of, two of her books. The first one was a PhD thesis, then the other one is, uh, I think, uh, The Night Dancer. Dancer. Yeah, The Night Dancer, which is uh, her latest book, I think. Yeah, the Night Dancer. G g give me a few titles you designed. Night Dancer, Chimamada's Americana, which is the new one. Um, uh, the new Kane Prize collection, I designed that one. I'm, I designed Helen Habila's uh, Measuring Times, uh, Oil and Water as well. Um, Tony Khan's uh, book. Um, Bed. Not Night of a Creaking Bed, one of his poetry collection. I've forgotten the title of the collection now. Um, Lola Shonayen's, you know, collection of uh, poetry as well, one of them. You know, so there are so many that are like, you know, it, uh, so many, both home and, uh, and abroad, you know, so yeah. Before we go on to the rest of Victor's interview, here's a replay of his book reading session at Rayleigh Gallery. Like I mentioned earlier, he read his essay titled, Love Letters. If you ever wrote any of such letters or received one, I think you will enjoy this. I'm talking about a real love letter written on special stationery with droplets of sensorobia perfume sprinkled on. I'm talking about the sort that makes your heart pound against your rib cage, like the ones that set me on fire in my village as a youth. I don't know about city boys, but the act of love letter writing taught me more English language than my so-called English teacher, who expected me to understand a foreign language taught in Asan. Someone once told me city boys never wrote love letters to guests. They used telephones to communicate their heart's intentions. Well, back in the village, we never saw a telephone, not to talk of using one. All we understood about telephone in the village was the reenactment of Alexander Bell's first version of tiny thread, of tiny thread from one empty tomato pep can to another pig milk can. <laughs> and honestly, no village girl had the time to put a rusty can on her ear to hear a boy's blab. So we wrote, actually, we crafted love letters. Right from time, the village boy understands the fact that the village girl is a delicate explosive that must be detonated carefully from a safe distance. And the best way around this is a love letter, whose crafting and editing is more rigorous than writing a letter of it tends to Harvard Business School. <laughs> love letters writing was an art taken very seriously. There were really no textbooks for reference at that age, and it wasn't in the school curriculum either. But I was lucky enough to discover my older brother's exercise book where he practiced his earlier attempts that had words like sugar and tea. Though he only ate roasted yam and oil to the best of my knowledge, and his later ones that were much more successful with big words like doxology and chronology. A good love letter took us three weeks or more to compose, edit, and deliver. Every, 
Okay. Everything about the letter was very important, from the salutation to the conclusion. And most importantly, you have to have a big word, you have to have a few big words borrowed from Michael West Dictionary and a killer nickname. My dearest Magdalene, I hope this letter meets you in good condition of health. If so, dissolve it. <laughs> I know you are wondering why on a clear blue sky day like today you are receiving this missive from me. <laughs> well, wonder no more because you are the only flower blooming in the garden of love this afternoon. <laughs> and in the night you are the only moon that makes the sky bright. Wow. I want to use this missive to let you know how much you mean to the life of my existence. <laughs> if loving you is a crime, I want to be guilty. <laughs> if loving you is a sin, I refuse to repent. <laughs> My love for you is it's as constant as the northern star. Until now, I have been drinking tea without sugar, but your beauty is sweeter than honey. All I'm saying is I want you to be mine forever because I can no longer live without you. Please, I hope you consider this humble and simple request because my life will never be the same again if you say no. I anticipate your favorable reply very soon, please. Yours and Ole Velasco de Hill. <laughs> The <laughs> love letter was never delivered by the writer. If he had the liver to deliver a letter, he would have spoken directly in the first place. There was always a loyal friend, a fearless student, a paid delivery imbecile. A school father or school mother who acted as postmaster and go between. And this postmaster had to be trustworthy because a love letter, if properly delivered, could make everything go early. One of my landed in the principal's office because, <laughs> because I have no English sending through the guest's one enemy. How do you know a delivered love letter was well received or is promising? Firstly, you don't see the principal breathing fire like a vexed dragon into your class while your biology teacher is teaching reproduction. <laughs> your friend, the postmaster, would usually bring you either of these two replies. Yes, she accepted it from me when I told her it was from you. Or no, she hissed and threatened to take the letter to the principal's office. A positive answer could almost make a boy's heart cease to beat because his attention is so focused on a no that a yes has no follow-up plan. <laughs> Eventually, his heart would commence beating faster than the pristines of a Ferrari. Do village guests reply with love letters to the boys? No. Village guests invented body and sign languages. <laughs> if she accepted the overture, she would coyly smile at the boy during assembly or chew on the edge of her checkered uniform. She would be the first to call horses at any bully who beat the living daylights out of such a boy under the fragile tree, or she would help him pick up his school bag from where it had flung in the scuffle, although no boy prayed for either of these fates. <laughs> She would ask him for ink for her fountain pen, though she had a drum of quink. She would, she would clap the loudest even when the boy soccer skis sucked. She would make eye contact while she played the, while she played the uh, clapping game with her friends. Suddenly, all her girlfriends would become the boy's friend, calling him by his nickname, Belasco, Belasco, Belasco. <laughs> During midterm exam, she will send a postcard that has two Caucasians with the bluest eyes on the back and I wish you success on the front. Then the boy would come home from an end of year disco smelling like he just emerged from the Sensorobia factory <laughs> because she had danced no woman no cry with him with both eyes closed. <laughs> Unfortunately, we no longer write love letters. This vital learning class that helped raise future poets has given way to text messages, which is the biggest threat to the English language as we know it. The village boy's glowing moonlight has given way to glow, and his shining stars have become starcoms. A contemporary village girl would rather accept a text message with a charge card than a well-written love letter that can't post a four-minute call credit. Thank you.